Our next speaker is uh, Associate Professor Dr Pauline Mealy. Pauline's from the DPI. She's a soil microbiologist with expert knowledge about earthworms and soil DNA sequencing. She leads a team whose work spans from the discovery of new bacterial species right through to applied aspects of microbial inoculant development and soil health education and trailing. Pauline. Thanks very much. Um, it's great to be back in the northeast. I lived here for quite a number of years and it's really lovely to be back. Um, so my talk today is about soil biology or soil biota and I want to make specific reference to uh, work I've, I did in the northeast uh, early on but also work more recently around Victoria um, and then I want to spend just a little bit of time if you're still awake to talk about some of the more exciting um, uh, things that we've been doing in our group around sequencing the DNA of the soil microbial community and I think Andrew is going to talk a lot more about that this afternoon but it's a very exciting time if you're in soil biology. Um, so, the con so the content of my presentation is really about providing some context for why we need to measure soil biota. Um, some of it will be, um, I think, you know, quite, quite straightforward to most of you. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir in, in some ways. Um, but then I want to talk specifically about some of the surveys that were done in Victoria. The earthworm work was done now 20 years ago, I hate to say, um, but it's still very valid for um, learning um, principles of how we manage our systems. Um, the second uh, survey I'll talk about is a more recent one done on um, measuring microbial biomass carbon. And as I said, I'll then talk about sequencing, why we need to sequence, and what it might be telling us about our soils. So if we step back a little bit and consider why soils are important, we don't have to go too far. Again, I'm preaching to the choir, but there's issues looming globally around food security. And I, I think we need to uh, make it clear to, to everyone that uh, for food security, we, we are reliant on soil security. And some figures were um, put up recently at a presentation I went to, which said that globally uh, there's 15% um, good quality land available. Um, there's 5% remaining for future use. However, given projections for 2050 on 9 billion population, um, the land required will be 9%. So this means, and I'm no mathematician, but that means there's going to be a shortfall in uh, good quality land for food production. And also in that context, uh, soil degradation is continuing. So we have to start thinking about some of the strategies that we might employ to try and um, address this, this issue of food, uh, soil security and hence food security. Uh, so we can maintain and protect the resource currently. Uh, we can try and enhance it or we have to go uh, and really stretch ourselves to think about how we might use land that we currently classify as marginal. So how do we protect, maintain and enhance our soil? So there are three things or points I want to make here and maybe raise some questions. So firstly we need to know what we want to protect. Um, and can we measure, can we put some metrics around what we want to protect? Um, we also need to understand the desirable range for the chosen biological measure. You know, what, what is the current measure? What's the attainable measure? Uh, where do we need to be at to be able to um, enhance uh, and promote better um, ecosystem uh, services? So, uh, and the third thing is we need to be able to relate those measures to how we manage. Uh, these, are, these are challenges that we need to um, address. So uh, in terms of relating that measurement of soil biota, we need to also think about what the extent of the benefit will be if we manage the soil biota um, uh, better. And is it worth the, worth the effort cost-wise? I think Andrew pointed out that it certainly is. 
And okay, and then there's sort of feedback loops operating. So I always put this slide up because I think we need to make the point that we, there's a lot we know about soil biology and soil functions. There's also a lot we don't know. But where we're at at the moment is that um, it, the, the way it generally works is the smaller the organism, the less we know about it. And, the, we, and that is because uh, the smaller the organism, the more diverse they are, um, and therefore the more difficult it is to, to identify what they are. Um, so these are just figures that basically says that. So for example, if it, there are viruses in the soil, they're probably the most numerous organism in the soil. We don't know anything about those, what they do, how they communicate with the bacteria, how they regulate bacterial and fungal populations in the soil. Maybe our soil gets the flu, we don't know. Um, and there are bacteria and archaea, that uh, third group down there. That group was uh, first discovered in uh, 1995 and that group is a huge group. It's one of the th three uh, branches of the tree of life and it's thought to be fairly significant in our systems and yet we know very little about it. So there's a lot of work to be done there. So the probably only other thing I want to draw to your attention is in the, in the last column uh, there's some percentages uh, in brackets there and they are percentages of um, uh, what we have basically categorised uh, in those groups. So they're the things that we have actually um, identified to a species level. So they're small numbers. So there's a lot of unknowns. And it's particularly true for bacteria and the other smaller organisms in our systems. Okay, so again, we talked about what is there. But we also know um, a lot about the functions that they play. When we talk about the trendy term at the moment is ecosystem services, uh, it is claimed that 80% of ecosystem services are provided by the action of um, the biology of the, of the soil system. So down the uh, left hand column you can see the functions listed. Um, and some examples of microbial processes that are involved in those functions. I'll just fl I'll go through those um, very quickly. The first lot of functions support economically viable crop yields um, and they're things like um, supports and anchors plant growth, suppression of crop disease, providing buffers for physical and chemical environment, um, control of water availability for plant growth, control nutrient availability. So they're all functions that can be attributed to microbial processes. There's another group um, which uh, work towards minimising negative environmental impacts. So their functions such as the provision of resilience, the buffering of water flows to reduce um, offside impacts, uh, buffering nutrient loss, um, Im uh, buffers impacts of pollution, source sink of greenhouse gases, self-maintenance of above and below ground ecosystems. So they're another uh, list of functions that can be directly attributable to microbial processes. So we do know a fair bit about the functions that are performed by some of these uh, soil biota. The other thing we do know, and I think uh, Lynn probably alluded to this, as did Andrew, is that it's a very complex system. Um, there's exceptional species diversity. It is well accepted in the uh, international literature that soils are the most diverse ecosystem on the planet. So in terms of looking at its uh, molecular or genetic makeup, it's probably the last cab off the rank in terms of actually tackling what's in the soil because it is just so species rich. There's also multiple species interactions and, and this um, slide, just uh, the diagram just illustrates that uh, there are lots of um, different species that uh, are located based on the, where the food source is and the quality of that food source and they basically work together. So the, the, uh, the nematodes will hang around where the bacteria are so that they can then eat the bacteria. So there's lots of interactions going on. You can also have uh, interaction between dung beetles and microbial communities. So 
Dung beetles, as you know, uh, create burrows in the system. It promotes um, can, uh, the water infiltration into that system, organic matter infiltration to depth, but it also encourages a proliferation of microbial communities at depth, which means you're getting um, more microbial activity deeper in the profile. And there's some fairly spectacular photos that Chip sent me some time ago, which illustrates how much uh, addition, proliferation of fungal uh, hyphae you can get down deep in those profiles. So to the first um, work that I did when I first went to Rutherglen, it was a, an earthworm survey and it was um, conducted in 1990 at 88 sites in the northeast mainly and it involved going out and setting up transect lines um, and those transect lines had five sampling points along them and we had to, in weather like this, um, hand sort through the, uh, the um, t uh, 0.1 metre block of soil down to 10 centimetres and painstakingly separate the, um, the earthworms from the cocoons. So that was uh, a fairly ex um, major undertaking. Some of the things we found from that work or one of the interesting things we found is that most of our species were exotic, so they were introduced from somewhere. Um, but there were some native species and they behaved in fairly interesting ways, so I'll talk a little bit about those. If we, um, if we look at the distribution of uh, species um, in those, at those sites, you can see in that middle graph, there's um, some black solid bars in there. So that's where you find the um, native species. So at some of those sites, you can get a dominance of um, native species over introduced species. I was never able to really pin down why it was that at some sites you got this predominance of native species, although I had came up with some theories about that. Along the bottom x-axis, you'll see um, C and P. Now, the P stands for pasture sites and the C stands for cropping sites. As you move further to the right, you will see that um, the P's become more dominant. So it really just shows that uh, in pastures, you have much higher earthworm densities than in the cropping situations. And I go into that in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. But the bottom graph just shows that the differences in cocoon distribution between pastures and crops. So evidently, for a whole range of reasons uh, that we can uh, talk about, the, uh, the earthworm abundance was much higher under pasture. <clears throat> so what was found at those sites? Well, there were dominant groups. So we had three families, Lumbricidae, Anthric, uh, and Acanthrodrillidae, I need to put my glasses on, and Megascalicidae. So those groups um, had co species that were commonly found in a lot of those sites. Um, if you look just at the uh, coloured uh, columns, you can see that uh, the Aparectidae caliginosa, which is the grey worm, was the most dominant across all crop and pasture sites. Um, and the next one down, Trapezoides, is the purple worm, was um, also the, well, the second most dominant, but it was really widespread. It was more widespread than the, the top one, the grey worm. So those two are probably the most common worms that when you dig in your, in your um, so soils, they're the ones you're li likely to find. You won't find compost worms, tiger worms, red worms in your um, agricultural soils unless it's very close to a compost heap. Um, and the other thing that was of note is down the bottom there, you've got the Spenceriella species and there was 364 um, found in pasture systems. So they're fair, they were fairly dominant for a native species. So they were the prevalent ones. So in terms of what they're doing then, if you look at the top, say, five of the earthworms in terms of what was dominant, um, they all behave in a similar way. So I know that um, Belinda's going to talk a little bit about this, so I'll just quickly mention that. Uh, so the purple worm up here, the grey worm, the rosy tip, the bioluminescent and the orange banded worms are all, all, all occupy this area in the soil. So they're called endogeic and they live in burrows around 10 to 15 centimetres. 
And I think it, it explains a lot in terms of the harmful effects of tillage, et cetera, on, on these species. So we don't have very many deep burrowing earthworms in our systems and we don't have a lot of litter feeding um, species either. So um, there's probably, the message from this is there's probably lots of room for um, introducing or enhancing the, micro, uh, the, the earthworm communities. So in terms of what regulates their um, numbers, their abundance, uh, one of the major controllers is precipitation. Um, Jeff Baker uh, some time ago uh, indicated that uh, based on a broader survey, um, if the annual precipitation was less than 600 millimetres, your numbers decline significantly. So in the northeast, we we're quite borderline between, you know, around about uh, 600 millimetres. But you can see from the, uh, the distribution here that uh, below 600, the numbers did drop off fairly significantly. So um, it did, my results also um, reflected uh, uh, Baker's um, premise there. <clears throat> In terms of chemistry, we found that there was greater abundance of earthworms uh, where you had more organic, organic matter and where the pH was higher. But it was really difficult to get correlations with a whole range of other things that we measured as well. And we put this down to the fact that perhaps those measures don't really describe accurately enough the habitat that that earthworm um, lives in. Perhaps when we take our chemical samples, we sledgehammer it, we mix it all up, so we're actually destroying the subtle spatial uh, variabilities, uh, variability that, that exists in earthworm habitats and the same applies for microbial habitats as well. So in terms of management then, now a lot of this is based on cropping work. Uh, this work was funded by Grains Research and Development Corporation, so you'll see the emphasis is mainly on um, cropping systems. But a few years ago we had a trial that really, that was based in three areas uh, that had been established for six years at the time that I did these uh, analyses. Um, and uh, basically uh, the, the same treatments, stubble treatments were applied at the three locations. There was a stubble incorporated trial, a burnt trial, a standing stubble trial as well as a mulched trial. Um, always, in all three sites, we found that the earthworms were more abundant at the mulched sites, so where you um, broke up the uh, stubble and let it sit on the soil surface. And they were always least abundant with stubble incorporation. Um, and then there were site-specific effects associated with burning, stubble or stubble left standing, though there were trends for greater abundance where you left the stubble standing. Um, and at those cropping sites across the board, there are really only, I've got four types there, and I'm just wondering, there's only three listed. Uh, so there was the purple worm, I think I know what the fourth one is. The, there was uh, the phosphorescent worm and the native species, which also came into play in a fairly big way. Um, the other things that we looked at um, in terms of management were stubble application, or the rate of stubble. Now these trials were only established two years, so the data I think or the results are probably less reliable. But what it did show is that um, earthworm densities um, were um, reduced where we added stubble and I'm not sure why that was the case but it's not significant the result anyway, uh, not, not statistically significant. Um, but earthworm biomass was higher where you added um, more stubble. So the, the more stubble you added the higher the, um, the, they got fatter basically. Um, so I think if that trial went longer, we would see that in terms of uh, numbers as well. That would start to play out in terms of having higher numbers or higher abundance where you've got higher stubble rates. But it was just, uh, yeah, it was only a short-term trial. Uh, the other interesting uh, uh, experiment we had was looking at the effects of herbicide application because it's one of the most commonly asked questions, what's the impact of herbicides? So, we ran a trial, it had only been going two years, but what we found was that um, uh, we actually saw more, um, more 
earthworms in the sites that had had their herbicide applied. And that really stumped me. But then I thought about, okay, um, what happens when you apply herbicide? You actually kill weeds and that releases um, organic matter into the system. Again, it's a short-term trial. I, we shouldn't read too much into that. I'm sure if it went longer, uh, then we would be at, we would uh, I would be much more, um, I guess, uh, yeah, confident with what the data was saying. Uh, pH. We we ran a pH trial. I didn't call it a liming trial because at the time we were um, actually acidifying the soil. So the three treatments we looked at was no change to the soil pH. Um, the, then we limed a, a one site and we also acidified a site by adding sulphur compounds. And the results from that were um, quite uh, interesting in that, um, you know, generally the control, for the more commonly found earthworms, they like the, uh, the control better. But um, if you go However, the uh, one, one species actually loved the lime. Um, it, sti it was stimulated by lime production. And the, the native species seemed to like where no one else wanted to go. So it seemed to be able to tough it out. And I, I think maybe it, um, my, my conclusion from that was that perhaps it wasn't a good competitor with the introduced species. And uh, so it just, wherever there wasn't a lot of other uh, species present, it was able to establish and really flourish, which was quite a surprising thing to see. Okay, so conclusions then from that survey. Well, we know worldwide that there's 6,000 species of earthworms that have been identified. We've got such a small proportion of those species in our soils. So. Um, all up, we've probably got 10 species that we're able to identify and nine, nine, uh, nine in a category that we didn't really know what they were. Um, pastures support uh, more earthworms and crop soil and those pasture sites were, um, had more cocoons there and it was probably related to the organic matter and lower levels of disturbance. Um, Earthworms do tend to follow the predicted trend for low numbers where rainfall is less than 600 millimetres. But I should say that even in some of the semi-arid cropping areas that I've been to, especially in the Gilgai country, even where rainfall is about 350 millimetres, if you've got local sites of higher moisture, you will find earthworms present. They probably won't be the density that you might expect, but they are still there. So. Although they might be in lower numbers, they are still probably impacting on the fertility of that system. Um, and mulching stubble is much more conducive to earthworm densities, and it's probably because it doesn't involve any kind of uh, massive disturbance. Um, increased abundance of earthworms in the second year following application of herbicides could be related to more available organic matter. I don't want to say too much more. And liming effects were site-specific, acidifying soil reduced densities, and native Spenceriella seemed to be the dominant. The next thing I want to just quickly talk about is microbial biomass. Microbial biomass is defined as the weight of or mass of the living component of the soil microbial community, or the soil organic matter and it excludes plant roots and soil animals. Usually it's estimated by fumigation of soil. So you can see some pictures here of that. We've got a jar there, we boil the, the chloroform, it fumigates the, the soil and the soil then releases the uh, nutrients that we then measure. It's the classic black box measurement and I'll talk a little bit about that again. Um, it's also considered the gold standard measurement for estimating soil biota in monitoring programs and I think Nathan might talk about that a bit later. Um, and it's generally believed, their value is in that if, um, the, the, if you have sites of high biomass, it usually means um, you've got a system that's favouring accumulation of, of organic matter. So in terms of a summary, this is a summary that was provi provided by Gonzalez and, and authors. There should be something along the bottom there. I don't know where it's gone. 
but it really just summarises the types of values you see in cropping, pasture and forest systems. Obviously, in forest systems, uh, you've got uh, higher levels of soil microbial biomass. Um, and uh, in pasture systems and cropping systems, it looks like um, you know, the, the pasture systems can be quite um, broad in, their, uh, in the range that you get, whereas in cropping systems, they generally tend to be consistently lower, so you don't get um, big maximum values. So, um, the, yeah, so the trend is that forests have higher biomass than pasture than cropping. Uh, in Victoria, we've now done a survey of about, say, just over 800 sites, um, which I've plotted there to not, not really good effect because uh, there are a lot of those sites have multiple uh, sampling points. But what we found from that survey is that we we had a, we got a minimum value of three milligrams per kilogram of microbial biomass carbon and a maximum of 808. So you get really widely variable um, measures for microbial biomass in our systems, which is, I mean, I'm a bit surprised at the three. I think that's quite low, um, but it is, that's what we measured. Um, and if you look at the, um, the, the, the mean or the average value, uh, well, the percentage of sites and, and the uh, microbial biomass, uh, the, at, at, so, the majority, or 45% of the sites had between 100 and 200 um, milligrams per kilogram of microbial biomass carbon, and the next uh, greatest percentage of sites had uh, 0 to 100. So fairly low in the scheme of things, we believe. Some of that we've just done, so all this data just came in recently, so we've just crunched some numbers here. Um, so in terms of what influences microbial biomass, um, clay content seems to be something that does. So the higher the clay content, the higher the numbers. Um, and uh, that seems to be in line with uh, what other studies have shown as well. The other thing that, the other main regulator is pH. <coughs> Again, the trend is for the higher the pH, the higher the microbial biomass. Um, and again, that is probably in line with what we might expect. <coughs> in terms of making something, however, of those actual values, we really need to consider, I guess, the targets that we, we, um, we want to achieve in terms of um, bringing our, carbon, our microbial biomass levels up. And again, in this paper by Gonzales et al., they tried to um, uh, establish what target values might be and the factors that define those target values. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, looking at what, what we probably should be considering is here's our actual value. Um, what we want to do is uh, aim for what is attainable based on manageable factors. So um, what we need to do is really establish um, some baseline levels, um, which is what we've kind of done in that survey, but also work out what is attainable for those systems. And we haven't, uh, monitoring isn't extensive enough yet to be able to really establish attainable levels. But this, um, program up here, which is funded by GRDC, is going to be collecting a lot more soil microbial biomass measures as part of a soil quality monitoring program. And the whole basis for that is to establish what, uh, what the attainable levels are for our soils in our area. So that's work that's uh, currently being funded by GRDC. So conclusions from the microbial biomass survey, well conclusions is probably a bit of a stretch, but um, soil microbial biomass values uh, were quite low um, in our systems, but when you consider that we've come out of a 10 year period of drought where there's not a lot of plant biomass going in, maybe that's, um, that's a reason for it. Uh, we've, uh, so the question we've got to ask is what are our attainable and potential levels? This is a work in progress. And we know something about what factors are affecting uh, or influencing the levels of soil microbial biomass that we achieve. 
Okay, so microbial biomass is your classic black box. It gives you a measure. Uh, what we're doing now with our molecular methods is trying to, well, is opening that black box to have a look a little bit deeper into the 15,000 species that we estimate are present in a gram of soil. So if we go back to these functions, if we really want to get a handle on who's doing what um, in our soil system, we really need to go beyond measuring microbial biomass. So um, a few years ago now, we um, embarked on a program of measuring DNA in soils. And we uh, also ran a few workshops uh, that uh, attracted quite a lot of uh, farmers to, to these. And we explained the principles of uh, why uh, of how you extract DNA from soil, but also why you would even want to do that. Um, so basically it goes back to what we fundamentally call the great plate count anomaly. And if you're trying to grow microbes, if you look at microbes um, down a microscope, this is what you might see. If you try and grow them, this is what you'll see. So this is what's called the great plate count anomaly and it just means that a lot of the microbes that exist cannot be grown. So you cannot take them out of their environment and grow. We haven't been able to reproduce the conditions that they require to be able to grow. So basically we assume then that there's probably 99% of microbes that uh, cannot be grown. Um, so, there's 90, so there's a lot of things in the soil that we don't even know what it does. So I think we need to be mindful of that when we talk about we're stimulating the microbes in the, in the soil, we're stimulating this group. The, the techniques really aren't there to definitively say what we're stimulating. So basically um, what we want to do is move away from looking at our pet microbes. You know, we want to move away from single um, microbe studies and treat the soil as a community of microbes that interact, as I said before, and help each other out and help the plants out and, um, you know, communicate with each other to allow a function to be performed. So our approach is to look at the entire microbial community. So how are we able to do that? As I said before, we can go to the soil. There are commercial kits available now, so you can take a, a little bit of soil, we're trying to make that a bigger bit of soil, and actually extract the DNA from that soil. And after we extract the DNA from that soil, we can do quite a few things. We can, uh, we can treat it in different ways. We can target specific areas within here. There are genes that are coded in here that will tell us what is there. There are other genes that will tell us what they're doing. So there's functional genes and what we call phylogenetic genes. So, uh, you can basically, once you've got the DNA, you can query it, you can really ask lots of different questions. So when we say to people when they're going out, they're doing their survey work, you know, we haven't got money to pay for the sequencing, we say at the very least put your soil in a freezer, in a deep freezer, so that one day there, there might be some money to go back and have a look at these additional uh, measures. Um, so then we can sequence that DNA. Um, but in doing that, we have to do something really rotten. We have to break up those um, bases. We have to break them up to be able to sequence them. But then what we need to do is reassemble them. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to do and there's a lot of challenges still associated with that. But I just want to um, highlight to you some of the examples we, uh, or some of the ways we've been able to use that DNA technology. In a study that we did with the Venter Institute from um, the USA, we took two soil samples. One, uh, so one was from a calcarosol up here. You might need to just click it all the way through until you get to the end. So, so we took a, a, soil a calcarosol soil type 
And what we did was um, we had a paired site. One was uh, in agriculture for a, nearly 100 years. The other one was a, a Cocamba State Park that hadn't been in, under agriculture. And we asked the simple question, do those sites um, have the same microbial communities using this sequencing technology? We also had a third site, there's another click, where we did a little bit of additional work. We didn't go deep into that site, but we wanted to have a, a, a more highly fertile acid soil as a bit of a, a, an additional uh, um, comparison. So we did a couple of things. You don't need to really know. This is the sampling strategy. But we recovered the DNA. You know how I said you can do lots of different things to it. With one lot, we basically targeted these genes, which tell us what's there. Um, so we did that for the three sites, all three sites. But for two sites, both the remnant and the managed up in the Calcarisol country, we just shotgun sequenced everything in the soil. So we, we shotgunned the whole, we, we smashed up the DNA and uh, we looked at what everything that was there. So we didn't target any particular genes. And basically from the uh, targeted, so, so with this targeted gene work, this tells us what's there. Um, we came up with um, a number of species that were present. All I want you to look at is the the, uh, the EFM, these three here, it's probably not good, they, they, they cluster here anyway. So when we looked at their diversity, um, we, we can see that the diversity levels sort of sit around there. They, and it sort of falls into nicely between uh, this really contaminated site these two contaminated, so, so one, sorry, one's a contaminated site, one's a, um, a rice paddy, so their ecosystems are very different. And up here is a forested system. So in terms of diversity, even though there wasn't a lot of separation between our sites, um, uh, based on this particular measure, it did sort of make sense that it fit in uh, with other sites around the world. So here we have a diversity measure for our systems. Um, but however, whilst the diversity measures were similar, the, the species that were present at those sites, the three sites that we looked at, were very different. So okay, diversity measures the same, similar, but the species present were very, very different. And there was very few, if we, so this was the, these are the two sites that um, are same soil type, one is a remnant site, one is managed, they share 469 species in inverted commas in common. Um, the calcarisol remnant and the Allenbank uh, ferrosol managed, the most different, shared only 100 out of possible this many and that many. Um, and all up there was of the 8,000 species, only 119 in common. So those different environments have very different species in them. So this is what you can get from this new technology. Um, with that whole, that other side of the graph I showed you before, when you smash up all the DNA and just sequence everything, you can also get a taxonomy of the, of the um, populations. So we compared, again, the remnant system to this managed system. And these are basically just um, ratios of relative counts. Uh, so for the archaea, which is that new group, they're more prevalent in remnant. Um, for bacteria, uh, the, the differences are, you know, you can see that uh, they're, they're slightly, sorry, I should say all up, sorry, um, what I should say, this is the, not the right graph here. Um, but Basically what you can say, say from this is bacteria are dominant. These are, these are percentages, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So bacteria present and dominant at uh, both of those sites. 80% of the whole community are bacteria. 17% are, are eukaryota, gen mostly fungi. There are some viruses present and there's also a 1% to 2% archaeal population there. Never before, these can't, or most of these can't be cultured. You can't grow them up in any other way. So this is telling us what uh, the composition of our communities are and how they differ 
between two sites. Um, so the other sorts of things you can do, you can really drill down into your community. So you can take the bacteria, which is the biggest component of the microbial community, 80% of the whole community was bacteria. You can drill down and look at different phyla. Um, this graph doesn't excite most microbiologists because they will say that these groups here are common groups in most systems. But it's this end, the tail end here, that is really exciting to most people. That's where we're starting to get into the really interesting, or the, the uh, this is where we start to see differences between um, treatments and systems. Um, and just another clip. So if we take one of those phyla, which is, a phyla, yeah, which is the actinobacteria from that previous graph, and, and uh, look at the ge genera that are present, if we go into the tail end, we start seeing really strong differences between those sites. So it really just shows us that um, it's not until you drill down to the lowest, you know, to the lower taxonomic levels that you really start to see the differences um, in our systems and what, what is exclusive to say one system, the remnant, these guys here and these guys here and what are exclusive to say the managed system. And then we can ask the question, well, what, what are those things doing? So. The other thing you can do, so you can look at what is there, the names of those things, but you can also, as I said, look at their functions. And this is the ratio slide. Um, so these are important functions uh, that we're interested in in our soils. Carbon degradation, carbon fixation. I liked Andrew's slide of the, uh, the tree with the photosynthesis going on, but there's also photosynthesis that happens in soils. There's photosynthetic organisms, the biocrust, is full of cyanobacteria uh, that also have a role to play in carbon fixation. There's nitrification, which is mineralisation of nitrogen, it makes it available to plants. Denitrification, fixation, phytate mineralisation unlocks the phosphorus in our systems and phosphonate mineralisation, also involved in phosphorus cycle. So now, this is a ratio value of counts um, between remnant and managed systems, so comparing the hits between those systems, you can see there are, there are some differences, um, particularly with phytate, higher in the remnant, phosphonate higher, so, so the functions involved in phosphorus cycling are higher here than there. Um, interestingly, the um, denitrification processes are much higher here. And that reflects, I guess, the fact that you've got more nitrogen going into that system, so more available for denitrification and loss. So, look, that's probably, I know, a lot of information in a short period of time, but um, I just uh, wanted to show you, I guess, the power of some of the new technologies, but also not diminish the uh, utility of some of those more stock standard measures that we take or we need to take in our monitoring programs. So these are the people, some of the people in my team that I just wanted to thank. So thank you.